For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Political analyst Professor Stephen Friedman discusses his book titled Power in Action, Democracy, Citizenship and Social Justice. Why did you think it was important to address democracy, citizenship and social change through a book? Well, um, I think democracy is a very important topic for South Africans generally. But <coughs> we're uh, at a stage now in which, first of all, democracy is under threat throughout the world. Uh, but secondly, you do hear voices increasingly in South Africa saying that democracy doesn't work. Uh, some people argue that democracy is a Western idea that should not be foisted on Africans. Some people argue that democracy is for the rich mm -hmm. and not for everybody else. Uh, and uh, I disagree. I, I think the evidence shows very clearly that we need democracy. And I don't think democracy is a Western idea. I don't think that it protects the rich. So the idea of the book is, uh, among other things, to try to deal with those ideas, to say, look, uh, democracy is important. Uh, but if we understand that democracy is important, we also need to understand that many of the things we are told about democracy and many of the things we hear about democracy do, in fact, send the message that it's only for Western people and only for the rich. Uh, and therefore, we need to challenge those ideas. Uh, if we want to claim democracy for ourselves. You are arguing that South Africans, like everyone else, need democracy for a more equal society. How near or far away is South African society from achieving equality? We're very far from achieving equality. I mean, one of the, one of the what some people see as the failures that of democracy is that if you look <coughs> at our economy 25 years ago when we became a democracy, uh, it was an economy which was very clearly divided uh, between the insiders and the outsiders, between those uh, who could get a decent job uh, and those who could earn a decent living and those who had to battle to survive. And if you look 25 years later, that's still the reality. I mean, certain things have changed, important things have changed. In 1994, uh, the people who uh, were inside were, were almost all white. Uh, today, uh, you know, black people, a section of, of, of black South Africa has managed to become insiders. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are still very heavily divided between insiders and outsiders. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, once again, some people say, well, how can you support democracy if that's what it's produced in 25 years? But I don't think that this is the fault of democracy. Uh, democracy is only a potential. Democracy says you have the opportunity uh, to act in particular ways if you want to do that. The problem we have, which is also a very important theme in the book, is that many people lack the opportunity to act in the way in which democracy says they're allowed to. So if you live in a nice suburb uh, like this one, and you want to influence uh, what goes on, uh, you go and you send an email or you send a, 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 a WhatsApp message or whatever it is, uh, you have the resources and you know who to contact, etc. I mean, if you, you know, if you are living in a shack settlement with uh, a, a sort of, you know, cell phone operating on, on prepaid, please call me, and uh, no telephone and no idea even of how to contact the people who could make a difference, you, you lose out. So, and that's why we have the inequality that we have. I mean, if people in shack settlements had the same opportunity to make their voice heard as people living in suburbs, we have a very different country. And Professor, why do you say that democracies can only work when every adult has an equal say in the public decisions that affect them? Well, my argument is not that democracy can't work without that. The, the question is what, you see, what is democracy? If, <coughs> you know, and that's why you know, some people think it's a Western thing. Some people will tell you, well, democracy uh, is, uh, is about free markets. It's about the ability to, to own as many businesses as you like. And there's some people who say, well, uh, it's like being uh, 
uh, like a Western European society, etc. But if you, com if you t <coughs> say, what is the difference between democracy and any other system of government? And then what I'm saying in the book is that the basic democratic idea is that every adult person should have, don't have, but should have an equal say in every decision which affects them. Now, I point out that there's no society in the world where that has happened. And there probably never will be a society in the world where that that has happened, that, that, that happens. But that doesn't mean that it's not an important goal that we ought to set ourselves. Uh, I mean, if you want to take a, another example, uh, we will probably, sadly, never have world, fully full world peace. We will always mm -hmm. have people fighting with each other. But that doesn't mean that we must stop working for peace. Uh, because if we work for peace, we get more peace than we would otherwise have. Similarly, if we work for democracy in this way, we can have more democracy than we had before, even if we never get to the perfect democracy. Chapter 9 deals with the fact that not all South Africans agree that building a democracy is a priority. Why is this common across the globe, particularly in new democracies? I think people have expectations of democracies which tend to get very easily disappointed because they're not realistic expectations. And I'm not saying that, you know, very often when you say realistic expectations, you're saying these folks down below don't, aren't as clever as us folks up here. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, I think the people at the top have the unrealistic expectations and people at the bottom. And, and the reason for this is <coughs> that people seem to think that all you do is you put a democracy in place, mm -hmm. and then all the good things happen. Uh, so that in our, our case, uh, you know, we, 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 you hear continually in our country that we have the most democratic constitution in the world. And perhaps that is true, but the point is that all the constitution does mm -hmm. is say there are things you are allowed to do, mm -hmm. and there are things you have a right to do. You can't leave it to the constitution. So in other words, we have a democracy, and that is important. Uh, and I must stress that anybody who says it is not important either wasn't around before 1994 or has forgotten what it was like before 1994. Uh, so it is important in all sorts of ways. But I think people expect, well, <coughs> you know, if you have a democracy, uh, then you ought to have lots of economic growth, which is what you hear. Well, that doesn't follow. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a democracy, you must be able to deal with poverty. You must be able to protect people who are weak. What democracy does is it gives you the tools to do that if you're able to do that and if you want to do that. But not everybody is able to do that and not everybody wants to do that. What kind of discussions are you hoping this book will evoke among those who will read it? Well, I'm really hoping that people, you know, we, we, we throw a lot around this term democracy a lot, either whether we like it or not. Yeah. Uh, and I'm <coughs> really the whole idea of the book is to invite people to think differently about democracy. So, uh, you know, <coughs> I don't know how widely it is, but uh, a couple of the early reactions I've got from people who've read it is this talks about democracy in a different way. Uh, and that really makes me very happy because whether they agree with the way or not, they are recognizing that there are other ways of looking at democracy to the ways in which we taught to look at democracy. So if you, with respect, open a newspaper or watch television or, or listen to the radio in this country, very often a particular view of what democracy is is being sold to you. I'm saying there are other ways of looking at democracy. And if people come away from the book simply saying, look, uh, let's think of other ways to look at democracy, even if they don't like the way I look at democracy. Uh, I think that would be a huge plus. In Chapter 10, you remind us that the collective action as democratic citizenship led to the formation of the treatment action campaign. Why is this important? Look, I, I, I devote a chapter to the treatment action campaign, and, and there are two reasons for doing that. The first reason for doing that is precisely that there are people who say <coughs> the Constitution might look nice on paper, but the Constitution can't fix real problems. And the Treatment Action Campaign is a very good example of how using the Constitution can fix real problems. I, I point out there that the treatment, the, the average member or the majority of 70% estimated 
members of the Treatment Action Campaign were uh, uh, single wim women who were single parents living in poverty in shack settlements. Uh, and that is actually, if you look at all the figures, that is the most marginalized group of South Africans. Mm -hmm. So this group of marginalized South Africans got together with other South Africans. And, you know, the, the importance of the HIV AIDS issue is we really need to reflect on the fact that because those women in Shack Settlement, the people who worked with them did what they did. There are probably four to five million South Africans who are with us today who would be dead if it wasn't for this, who would be dead if it wasn't for democracy. So in that sense, it's very important. The other sense in which it's very important is, uh, you know, I, 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 I've, I've said a bit about collective action. I've said democracy is just a possibility. And what the possibility is, is the possibility to act with other people who share the same interests as you do, who feel the same way as you do about an issue, to change what you want changed. And that's what they did. They showed that even very marginalized, uh, powerless members of society can get together, act collectively, uh, and, 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 and bring about a huge change, which, which you know, I don't think we should minimize how big this change was. In chapter six, you say that in very rare occasions, business people and professionals can be seen demonstrating with their fellow citizens in support of democracy. Should this be happening on a larger scale? No, I, I'm, I'm not saying it should be happening on a larger scale. In fact, look, I don't have any problem with protest. I think people have a perfect right to protest. Mm. And I think that we, we often, you know, some people sometimes say, you know, we're a democracy now, people shouldn't be protesting. Mm. And, and that's not true. Democracy is, among other things, the right to protest. However, what I am saying there is that when you use the term collective action, which is basically an academic term for people working with each other, people tend to, academics as well, if you look at the academic writing on the topic, academics and people who are not academics tend to think of people marching in the streets, and that's collective action. And what I'm saying is that is not the only form of collective action. And in fact, it's not the most common form of collective action. Because if collective action means people working together, okay, if you're in a suburb, for example, and we'll get to the business people in a moment, mm -hmm. if you're in a suburb, there is usually an active residence association who knows who to speak to in the city council, um, who essentially acts on your behalf. So all you have to do, the only collective action you have to do, you don't have to go out, and, you have to either join the residence association, sometimes you don't even have to join the residence association, you can simply uh, tell the residence association what you want. Uh, in the townships and in the shack settlements, it's not like that, okay, because people may have civic associations or whatever, but it's not because, because they're, 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 they're powerless people or, or people with a great deal less power, they don't get listened to that much. Business people get engaged in collective action the whole time. And the point that I'm making there is if you say that to many people, they say, but why can you talk about business? Business people never get involved in collective action. You never see them in the marches or whatever. And I'm saying they don't have to. They don't have to march because they can pick up a phone or they can send an email to the business association that they're part of or, or something like that and somebody will go and speak to the minister and something will happen. Uh, we will have, we will, well, we'll never have a perfect democratic society. We will have a much more democratic society when everybody has an opportunity to act collectively. It's what I call in the book routine collective action. So every time, you know, you, you speak, very often you speak to people and you say, oh, no, no, well, they don't, they've never been involved in, in collective action. And what they mean to say is they've never been on a protest march. But when you start saying to them, do you, do, do you vote? Well, that's collective action, okay? Uh, have you ever, you know, complained to, 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 to the city council about anything. Yeah, well, I wrote to this. That's you know, all of this is collective action. So what I'm saying is we mustn't think of collective action only as protest. Protest is what people do when the routine collective action doesn't work. And lastly, can this book assist those who will be voting for the first time on May 8th? Well, I, it certainly doesn't tell them who to vote for. I don't <laughs> think it's my job to tell any. 
I, 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 I always avoid the question when people tell, ask me who they should vote for. I would hope that new voters would, 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 would look at the book and get a sense, if, if it makes sense to them, um, of, of, of the system that they are now active members of. Uh, because, of course, once you get to voting age, uh, you become a person with that right to be heard. Um, and I, I would hope that they would look at it and get a greater sense of how they can make themselves heard. And also, hopefully, when they cast their vote and when they conduct themselves, to do it in a way which, as much as possible, enables other people to be heard as well. So, uh, if you have an opportunity to vote in ways which make it more likely uh, that more people will be heard, well, I think that is very important. Um, I think it's also, and there's the other thing I want to mention is, is uh, which is discussed in the book in some ways. When one has the vote, the vote is very important in a democracy, but we must never make the mistake of assuming that the vote's a bit like a, an ATM or a slot machine, you know, because that's the, that's the textbook view. Mm -hmm. So you say to the young person, well, now you've got the vote, you can vote for whoever you like, and then they'll do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's not true, okay? Uh, and really what we've discovered, and the book talks about in a lot of contexts in, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, or, um, if people have the vote, it gives them a lever to force politicians to do things which politicians wouldn't otherwise do, okay? Um, if, if groups of you start saying to politicians, look, if you don't take any notice of us, <laughs> yeah, and, and we're actually, interestingly, we're seeing that, you know, it's interesting that people at the grassroots, people living in poverty in this country, they get that immediately. They understand that immediately because one of the things we've already seen and we've seen it time and time again. The early stages of the election campaign, they start to say, OK, you don't listen to us. You're not getting our vote. And that's the way it should be. That's the way it's supposed to happen. So I think everybody, whether you're middle class, whether you're working class, whether you live in a shack or whatever, um, that, that vote is a weapon which goes way beyond getting to choose a party on a ballot paper. It, it's, it can be if you use it well. It can be your way of making sure that you and others who share your experience actually get treated like, like citizens. Uh, I quote in the book a man called Partha Chatterjee, who's a, who's a very interesting Indian writer. And he talks about people in shack settlements, uh, slums in India. And he says, and, and that really conveys very well what I'm trying to say. He says that there's a contradiction about about people in slums in India. If you look at the Indian constitution, they are human beings with the vote and, and rights, etc. If you look at how they're treated by the, the municipality, they're a planning problem because their shacks in the wrong place or their huts in the wrong place. And what Chatterjee says is that democracy, including the vote, can help people who are treated by, 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 by those in power as problems become citizens with rights. And I think that's the way in which the lever needs to be used. That was political analyst Professor Stephen Friedman speaking to Polity about his book titled Power in Action, Democracy, Citizenship and Social Justice.